I, my, my presentation would be at the macro level of open universities. Mm -hmm. And Begonia knows from writing with me also in articles that we are very much interested in the, uh, the, the macro level. Uh, so the lecture, as you see, is open universities worldwide, uh, current challenges, and future prospects. Before, okay, I have not started this. <laughs> Before uh, I, I will start talking about the challenges, I want to say kind of the state of art of distance education. According to the estimate of OECD, UNESCO, the World Bank, there are currently more than 170 million students all over the world. And approximately 10% of these students study in various forms of distance education. I want to say something about the, it's okay? Yes. I, I want to say something about the 170 million, because higher education systems in Europe uh, have a tradition history of more than 900 years. The first university was in Bologna, was established in 1099, and it still operates. And, but but the, it was always a very selective group that studied in higher education. According to various estimates that we have, it's very difficult to get this data, but we did something in the Fulbright New Century Scholars program that we had, and the estimate is that at the start of the 20th century, around the First World War, all over the world, there were just one million students, even less than one million students. So just think that only in 100 years, less than 100 years, the number jumped from one million students all over the world to 170 million students which is a huge, not only quantitative, but also qualitative uh, change, huge qualitative change. It also says that most of the higher education institutions is quite new, because if only 100 years ago, less than 100 years ago, one million students studied, and now 170 million, so obviously we have many new higher education institutions, and many also, part of it, are also distance teaching open universities. About open universities, about 50% of the distance teaching students, that are 17 million distance teaching students, which is quite also a number, half of them, 50% of them, study in a, what is called fully-fledged autonomous distance teaching universities, like this university, like my university, but the other 50% study in different type of higher education that are not distance teaching institutions. And just the manifestation of it is that the uh, International Advisory Committee, which convened here uh, three weeks ago, and I am part of it, only Terry Anderson and myself are coming from a distance teaching university. The other members are coming from campus-based universities. Mm -hmm. So now campus-based universities are also very much part of the distance education scene. I will focus my discussion mainly on distance teaching universities, which are fully distance teaching universities, but I will also mention the others. If we look, we'll look at different classification parameters of distance teaching universities. Uh, and you have here institutional mode, uh, gen generations of technology, size, public, uh, private, scope of operation, instructional approaches, and innovative clusters. I'm going to make it very clear in each of the uh, these cat categories. If we look on the institutional modes, so we have the single mode uh, universities, like Universidad Obierta de Catalonia, and like the Open University in Israel. But I will jump one, and I will say that even in this ge generic mode in the literature of single mode distance teaching universities, there are very different type universities, very different. Not only that, the word open university, here it's also called Universitat Obierta de Catalonia. But the f open university in Britain was established because it had an open admission. There are currently 30 something single mode distance teaching universities in the world, but only five or six have an open admission. Universitat Obierta de Catalonia does not have an open admission. So the openness dimensions are manifested in various different domains. But the open admission is problematic in, in uh, higher education, mainly because the traditional universities usually look down at universities that adopt an open admission. And I remember when I contributed an article to the book of uh, Ima Tubela in Begonia, and they always asked, how high school students study at your university? 
they do not have a matriculation examination, I said, but we have an open admission. We do not need any uh, matriculation examination. I forgot that you have an open <laughs> admission. So basically, open admission is something that I think only the open university in Britain, the Dutch open university, the Israeli open university, at the Basque university, and two other universities have an open admission. All others decided that they do not want the other universities to look down at them, and they have admission, sometimes relaxed admission criteria, but they have a relaxed ad admission criteria, uh, still admission criteria as the universities. Let's look at, let's, uh, look at some of the universities. The UK Open University was established, you know it, on, uh, very briefly, was established in 1969, but it's a very different type of university because it's based on the industrial model, and I will talk a little bit because you are a very different type of uh, university. It has currently more than 200,000 students. It is considered by far the mecca of the distance teaching universities. It is the only distance teaching universities that appears in the list of the 500 leading research uh, universities uh, published by Jiao Tong, the Shanghai uh, University, is the only distance teaching university that appears as a leading research university. And it's a different type. It's a, based exactly, uh, again, on, on the uh, industrial model. Fern Université, like UNED here in Spain, were established two, three years after the Open University, in 72, 73, something like that. But they decided that beyond the fact that they are going to be a distance teaching university, they want to resemble in any other aspect to the traditional universities, to be as like, alike as possible to other universities. So they send their materials, but the entry uh, qualifications, the exit qualifications, the study programs, everything is exactly like other universities in Spain or uh, in Germany. So very different type. Compared. UK Open University was really innovative. Everything was innovative there. The open admission, they started the year in February in order not to, to, to have the summer schools during the summer. They, when they opened their doors, in Britain only 2% of their students were part-timers. There was no part-time studies in Britain in 1969. So they were the university for part-timers. So they were really very innovative. UNED in Spain, in Spain and Ferran Universität in Germany, in Hagen, not innovative. They were just distance teaching universities, not innovative. <laughs> the Open University of Catalonia, obviously very innovative. Because I, I was here uh, 14 years ago when it really was established and I had the privilege also of meeting in uh, Cologne, uh, Scope, uh, Gabriel uh, Ferrate, uh, the, the establishing president of the university. He had a vision, he established it, he did all the right things. I fell in love with this university, and Begonia knows that when she visited our university, yes. somebody I said, Begonia is from Catalonia, ah, this is the university that you love more than ours. <laughs> so this is, <laughs> what is it? This is how, I, how I present it. So you really did all, all the right uh, things concern e-learning online, and I will touch on it a little bit uh, later. China Central Radio and TV University, since 2009 it is called the Open University of China. Very different type, it's based mainly on TV. Lecturers are lecturing up till now. They come, they lecture on TV, when the time is done, the chalk is kind of uh, down. They go back to work and they have study groups at work, uh, very different. So you see, single mode distance teaching universities, but very, very different. They have more than two million students, which is really a huge university. Uh, National Technology University, NTU, in, in the United States. It's the wet dream of administrators. It's a university with no academic faculty. How does it operate? Only master degree engineering programs, and it is kind of an intermediate body that uh, takes wonderful master degree courses from leading universities, including Berkeley, MIT, and others, and more than 500 companies. And they are granting the degrees, but they do not have their own professors. And the professors must be really very good lecturers because they have an evaluation every semester. And if the students do not like the professors, they change them. So it's kind of a win-win situation because the professors get money for having students in their regular classes, but also online in the NTU. Uh, most of the students do not uh, use it as kind of the satellite, but more the recorded 
lessons, so more than 80% because they are working. So they, it's not kind of a simultaneous syn syn synchronous. They use it more as a asynchronous. I think now it's not so popular. But once it was very popular, a very different type of university. And Phoenix University, which is the largest distance teaching private university in the United States, it started mainly not as an online university. It started as a face-to-face -face university, but the fact was that it spread through 200 different locations in the United States. They used to rent a, a building near a, high road, a highway that it would be very easy to come from different places and have a large parking. This was one of the conditions. <laughs> and, the, <coughs> yes. and, and Exactly. And the, the students would come and listen. So at the beginning, it was totally a face-to-face -face university, but the distance was spread. Now, I think more than 60% study online, but still, many come to these 200 different locations, campuses, and study. By the way, when I was here in November 2009, and there was a SCOP meeting, the stand, uh, Standing Conference of Presidents of the ICD, mm -hmm. and I, I had their lecture in, 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 in this conference, there was a very interesting debate on what constitutes distance. And I remember that uh, the people that came from UMUC, University of Maryland University College, which is the largest public distance teaching university in the United States, said that when they sent their lectures to their military, to their army, in different locations, in Germany, in the Far East, this is distance. They teach them face to face, <laughs> but they, it is distance, true. And I remember that Marta Mena said, no, this is not distance. Distance is only when the students is separated, not, not like we here, <laughs> yes, but <laughs> is separated from the audience. And it's a very interesting kind of, uh, I think, debate what constitutes distance. It's only when the students do not see the lecturer, or now with online they can see me lecture, even if they sit in Kamchatka. So, 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 so yeah, the whole thing is really very, very interesting. Let's move on. No, I want to go back. Yes, you see the dual mode universities. Dual mode universities actually were established uh, at the uh, 60s or something like that, mainly in Canada and Australia. And Begonia told me that she now is involved in a project in Sydney with Australia because these are huge, they have a small population, but they have huge distances in Australia and in Canada. And they decided that they do not need specific designated distance teaching universities. They will kind of uh, assign the role of distance education to leading campus based universities. This, this is the case in Australia to this day. So this was the whole idea of dual mode, that the same professors teach simultaneously the campus-based and distance teaching uh, students, and the proportion is 60 to 40 percent, 50 to 50 percent. So it's a very different kind of notion. This is not the blended mode. It's kind of, they teach two different target populations. One is situated on the campus, and the other somewhere in Australia or in Canada. Now you have many dual mode universities, and I think uh, part of the confusion also in uh, the relevant literature is that the dual mode and blended mode and all these things are kind of uh, in a confusing terminology. It's not the same thing, and I will say something about the blended. Dual mode is not uh, blended. If you look at dual mode universities, so you have the on, -off, on and off campus students in Canada and Australia, you have branch campuses, mainly in places like Qatar and Singapore. You have many branch campuses of good universities, of a and Texas University, of McGill University, of, of different universities. So this is also type of dual mode university because you have operation in branch universities and offshore extensions, which are not full kind of branches, but off offshore extensions. Now, when we look on the blended mode, And part of the literature, I looked at the book of uh, Tony Bates and uh, Albert Sangra that was published lately. Uh, they relate to the blended and, and uh, uh, other terminology related to it. The whole idea is that you combine face-to-face -face and distance teaching in different settings. 
but it can be done at the level of any given course. So I can give some of the lectures online, but still meet my students face to face, so it's any given course. It, it can be at the level of a program. Some of the course is totally online and some are face to face. And it can be at the level of a, a, a whole degree. So the blended, what is blended, is, is very differentiated between different uh, set, setting and different con context. So basically, I could not uh, say that blended mode is a separate mode like a dual or single mode, because it can be uh, operated in single mode distance teaching universities. Obviously, all the members that came from campus universities, this is exactly how it is, by no means cannot not be characterized as a distance teaching university that we have uh, Martha Stone from Harvard, and they operate different programs distance. So, so this is exactly like single mode. Uh, so you have single mode distance teaching universities, and you have obviously campus-based universities and extensions and dual mode and consortia. You can use blended uh, teaching in all different types. It's not characteristic only to dist distance education. Now if we move to another category of generations of technology, so obviously you have the print-based and multimedia and computer-based, you know it very well, I will go very fast. Print-based is basically the first year, high, uh, distance education at higher level, edu at higher education, uh, is around 150 years. And one of the examples that I love very much, Professor Knight uh, from uh, a Scottish University, uh, St. Andrews University, didn't like the fact that women were not allowed to study higher education. You know that in England, until the start of the 20th century, women did not study. So it was, they were not allowed to study. So he started a, a special program in literature by distance education from 1873, and he operated by himself. So basically this is 150 years of history of distance education, but it was very clear what is distance education, which is not clear right now. Because the whole idea of a regular university is that you assemble students from different places onto one campus. This is the idea of a university. Distance education is very clear. You say you go the other way. You kind of go from one campus to different places. This is why distance is also when you say that you send to 200 different locations of Phoenix University. Now distance, because of the online and the technology, is not very clear what is distance. And this is part of also many articles uh, that we have. But the generation of print is also existent now. Even when we use the computers, we still print things. I printed today, I had a problem of printing things. But this is also a, a kind of print. So in the multimedia and also computer-based, you're also printing. So it's not kind of the, the generation of print is over. It kind of took a different uh, version. Now, uh, the industrial model is very interesting. And when I move to the challenges, you will see that this is one of the challenges of online education, including this university. John Daniel, who was for many years the vice chancellor, the president of the Open University, but he, he once gave a wonderful talk about a recollection of a gypsy scholar, because he came from England, he studied his PhD in France, he was a vice president in two universities in Canada, and then moved back to England. So he, he really got the idea of several cultures. And he also wrote in his writings, very much established the, the term of the golden or uh, uh, iron uh, triangle that succeeds to balance between access, quality, and cost the industrial model. What was the whole idea? That you invest a lot of money, which is not the case now. You do not invest so much money in uh, producing courses. Because once they could invest half a million pounds in producing one course in England, which is a huge amount of money. But the whole idea, of, I remember when I visited it, when I still was a master degree student at my university, and I was an assistant, and I visited Milton Keynes in the Open University, I was astonished that in one uh, education course, they had 22 people, that, a team of 22 people that developed the course. 22 people in a team that developed one course. Half a million sterling uh, pounds. A very different notion. But the whole idea was that you teach many students. The idea of the industrial model, you cannot establish a small university for 1,000 or 10,000 students. You need dozens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of students. And the more students you get, the less the cost per capita. 
So you keep the, the quality because you invest a lot of money in preparing very high quality materials. You, you can enroll a huge number of students which are not uh, limited by the campus uh, grounds and you reduce the cost. The studies on cost are very problematic in distance education and you have some, very few, but still they indicate that sometimes it can be reduced to 50% of a graduate. And the whole issue of graduates is also problematic because you have a very high rate of dropout. So th then you start and you say, but how many graduates compared to the people that are enrolled? But still, the whole idea of the industrial model was to enroll huge numbers of students, to reduce the cost per student, and to uh, provide very high quality materials, materials, which is not the case of online education at all. One of the challenges of online is exactly to find is the golden triangle of this balance between access, cost, and quality in online education. And it has not been found yet. This is one of the challenges. Because if you teach 20 students with a professor online, sometimes it's more costly even compared to face-to-face -to -face classroom. So the balance between access, quality, and cost is not clear at all in online uh, education. Obviously, the multimedia, I'm not going, you know exactly what is the multimedia in the Open University, very much used it. Now it's much easier in the technology uh, times that we live because they had to uh, develop special lab, portable labs and send it to students. It's much more easier now, now, now to do it, but I will not dwell on it too much. Computer-based is also clear. Now I want to say something about Begonia knows my my underlying uh, line of this. In the relevant liter literature, there is a huge, huge uh, blurring of meanings between e-learning, and we are here in an e-learn center and distance education. I have an article that is exactly entitled this: distance education and e-learning, not the same thing. It's not the same thing. Not only that. I would say that most of the e-learning applications, most, the majority of e-learning applications are taking place in campus-based universities. You are very much an exception. No. And most of the distance education, when we take Indonesia and India and Thailand and China, are not carried on through online. So to say that right now distance education is mainly carried online, looking in, on, on a global uh, picture, it's not true. Most of distance education, if we take the 70 million students that study distance education, are not studying distance education online, mainly because in some of the countries that have such huge numbers of students, there are not appropriated infrastructures for online education. And many rich universities, including Harvard and MIT and Cambridge and others, use it extensively and intensively because they have the money. They do not need it so much, but they have the money. And here is the paradox of the rich and the poor, that those that have the possibilities to use it, they sometimes do not need it so much. And those that need it badly do not have the possibilities to use it. And this is, what, again, one of the challenges, the digital divide, one of the huge challenges uh, uh, f facing today um, the distance education. This is a book that I also g gave uh, Albert and also Begonia uh, on digital technologies, which I published two years ago in higher education. And I try to explain the gap between some of the sweeping expectations that were echoed uh, 10, 15 years ago and the reality. That some uh, person like Peter Drucker he uh, predicted that, that the campus universities will be dinosaurs, that they will not exist within 30 years. N none of such things happen, and it will also not happen. So it, yeah, I believe it will not happen, because of many different reasons. And uh, so this is now science. Uh, John Daniel, the same John Daniel, uh, wrote, it, it was, by the way, he did a master degree in distance education in one of the Canadian universities. And the thesis of his master turned to be the book on mega universities. And the mega universities, he coined then the term mega universities. 
that have more than 100,000 students. So you still do not reach it, and our university still does not reach it. But there are some universities that have more than a million, inclu including in Turkey, and obviously in Thailand, Indonesia, and in uh, China, more than a million students. So he said that a university that operates on the grounds of more than 100,000 students is a mega university, and it has a very different operational uh, underlying uh, pre premises. Size is most important in the industrial model. It's totally not important in online. Online, you can operate even more successfully in very small uh, universities. And here I understood that one of the uh, challenges in very highly market demanded programs that you have, that in some of the classes you have more than 50 students. Which according to various studies, 20 to 25 is the maximum in order to have an effective and efficient online classroom. So basically, it's a huge challenge of not holding more than 20, 25 uh, students. Obviously, one of the categories is also public-private. Uh, you have uh, large-scale distance teaching universities, mainly public. Here you have a very special or uh, kind of combination because you have a, a public university managed by a private board, true? In, as far as I understood from John's videos. Yes, this is the uh, info Ima. And you have private for profit, the non-profit providers and private operation within public universities, like Hong Kong University, which is a campus-based university, is a very interesting example. It has 20-something thousand students, resident students on campus, but more than 200,000 students would study in various programs which are distance and online, but the advantage, advantage that they have is language. Hong Kong, they speak both Chinese and English. And the potential target population of Chinese and English-speaking people is very, very large. So here you have a public university which has private operations, distance private operations, and they get a lot of money from companies, but still they are a very uh, much research-oriented university and highly regarded research. University, uh, Hong Kong. Scope of operation, and I will move to the current challenges. Scope of operation, you have local universities like Fern University, which was established in North Rhine Westphalia. It's not a German university, but it operates now like a German university. You have Athabasca University, which was established in Alberta, but operates like a Canadian university. You have national universities. Like also you, you are Catalonian University. We have national universities like UK or U, and like UNED, and like our, we are a national university, and you have a global operation. In the article that I contributed to the book of Ima Tubela and Begonia Gross, the name of my article was that the main challenge of universities, not only distance teaching universities, but universities, is now to move from operating in a national system to a global landscape, which is a huge change. Because higher education as a system is a, ve a very new notion from the, I would say, the middle of the 19th century. We start to speak about higher education, which is more than single uh, universities or higher education institutions. And the idea is that higher education institutions in any given national country, in Spain, in Germany, in Israel, have something in common which differentiates them from other countries. And Bologna process is exactly the one that tries to harmonize between the so many different cultures of higher education. So one of the huge challenges is to move from a national system to a global uh, landscape. And distance education universities are very well situated uh, to do it. But still, it is a huge challenge. Instructional approaches, I will jump on it, it's not so, so important. And innovative clusters, I just wanted to say something in one of the books that I wrote about distance and campus universities, tensions and interruptions, and it was published in 1999, many years ago. One of, one of my chapters dealt with uh, innovative clusters to see to what extent uh, distance teaching universities are innovative. Many, as I said, Fern University Net were not innovative. The Atabasca University, the Open University in Britain, also Israeli, very innovative. I do not know how many of you 
I kind of asked Terry Anderson when we met, met here a few weeks ago, it, it is still existing. For example, some things that will never ever be viable in Israel, and I think also not here in Catalonia. But you know that in Atabasca University, they have a special general degree, BA general degree, that you can earn without studying even one course at Atabasca. Do you know it? You get a degree from Atabasca without studying even one course in Atabasca. It's kind of a bank of accreditation. In our, in our case, at least 50% of the degree has to be studied at our university in order to get a degree from our university. So the innovative clusters are very different from one distance teaching university to, to another. A very interesting topic, but I will move on to the ch challenges. The main area. The challenges. Okay. A competition with many campus-based universities and new online providers. Obvious. Once distance education was very distinct, it was clear what is campus-based university and what is distance education. Because many campus universities are engaged currently in distance education. It is not clear anymore what is the distinct role of distance education institutions. A huge problem. Like in our case, now the Technion in Israel, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, uh, Ben Gurion University in, in the Negev are starting to offer online programs. We have to decide whether we compete with them or we uh, collaborate with them. I believe collaboration is better, but some think it's better to compete. So basically, it's a huge challenge. How to define the role of mainly single more distance teaching university in the face of a growing number of students that are enrolling in campus-based universities. Not only that, obviously Harvard and MIT have such brand names that students would like to study at such universities. More than that, the large uh, philanthropic uh, foundations like uh, the Gates Foundation and uh, the UL Foundation when they want to do experiments on online education, they mainly give money to MIT and to uh, Cambridge University. They do not give money to Universidad Abierta de Catalonia and to the Open University of Britain <laughs> or to, to, to Israel. So it's kind of a challenge because there are, is much more experience in the distance teaching universities, but the large corporations go to the brand names of uh, the universities and the competition is very, very fierce. A second challenge is obviously re reduced budgeting from the governments in, in face of everything that, that is happening. The British Open University, for example, at the beginning, it was the, the dream and baby of Harold Wilson, who was the Prime Minister of Britain. And he appointed Jenny Lee, his colleague, to be a minister for the Open University in Arts. So it was a new ministerial post, Open University in Art. They got 100% funding from the government for the 21st years of the operation. Envious, true, we are envious. In our case, we get 20% of the budget from the government and 80% is based, based on tuition fees. The opposite the other universities. They get 70, 80% from the government and 20% is, is tuition fees. And now I see also in Britain, the British Open University is now also competing for fund. So I don't have to tell you that funding is a very crucial issue uh, currently in all universities. Changing the technological and instructional, in, uh, and instructional infrastructures of the large scale open university. You in Universitat Abierta de Catalonia do not have such a problem because you were established as an online uh, university. So from the very start, your instructional model is based and suitable for the online era, which is not the case for Britain and for Israel and even not for Atabasca and Fern University in Oneg. It's a huge problem. Just to give you an example of how huge the problem is, at our university you would not believe. Uh, we have 43,000 students, less 93, less than 100 academic faculty, which have a nomination at the university. Others are just tutors and course coordinators which unlike the case you have here, which you draw professors from other universities, they are not professors. They are master degree and doctoral students. 
So the whole distribution of the learning is very different. And it's very difficult to take the industrial model and transform it into the digital era. A huge problem. Even the British Open University, they use online, but in very few courses, mainly as an add-on function, still the print-based technology is the main technology that they use. So it's not your problem, but it's a problem of most large-scale distance teaching university. How to transform to the online era? Because now it costs more. They take the regular model, they add on, so it costs more, and they do not know exactly how, 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 to, how, how to do it. So it's a huge, huge challenge. Ensuring quality of teaching and uh, evaluation. In the industrial model, there was a very stringent system of quality control, because if you produce material centrally, by large teams with many counselors, many evaluators, you control the uh, quality. And the same materials are taught by everyone, the same exam is given by everyone. Well, I talked with Terry and he was surprised, he didn't know that in your case, you have something that is central. You decide on the core of how the courses are based. But still the professors, because they, they have a venia legendi of professors, have the degrees of freedom to design their own exams and their own uh, assignments, true? Which is not the case in my university, and not the case in the British Open University, and not the case even in Atabasta University. The assignments have to be exactly the same for all students, and the exam is exactly the same for all students. So the instructor does not have any degrees of freedom to change anything of the pre-prepared materials, pre-packaged materials during the teaching period. This is the whole idea of the uh, industrial model which is totally alien to the idea of online, mm. flexible teaching, constructive teaching and all this. So it's a huge, huge, huge dilemma. And many articles, no solution yet about uh, how you do it. Now, in the case of online, how you ensure quality, this is a problem. Because one professor can be very qualitative and another one, another one can be less. Uh, designing and ongoing support for teachers and students. Maybe with Albert, I will write an article on e-teaching as an essential counterpart of e-learning. And in the article with Begonia, we had some, some part of it. Here is an e-learning center. You speak all the time on e-learning. You mentioned also teaching. But it's kind of taking something as, as, as is obvious. The students is, are in the center. Once I heard a wonderful uh, <coughs> uh, lecture on children about pedocentric pedagogical approaches. And it was Chaim Omer, Professor Chaim Omer, and he said something beautiful, which I really adopted from him. He said, it's a mistake to put children in the center. Children should be in their place, not in the center. It was a wonderful observation. <laughs> I, I, and I, I, I adopted for, for saying about students. Students should not be in the center. They should be in their place. And in er, any learning teaching process, there is a huge and important role for teachers and a huge and important role for students but they are not in the center. And in many of the articles, you have the students are now autonomous, they can do whatever they want, they can study, they can uh, conduct their own uh, programs, they can design their own program. Nothing is far from reality from that. Very few students. I take my son, who is 24 years old, and studies now psychology and communication at Ben Gurion University. He's a whiz in computers. When my computer fails, he saves me. So he really, many hours of, of his day are spent in computer. Is he willing to study for computers? No. He wants to hear lectures at a campus-based university. So most students do not know how to study by themselves. And most teachers were not brought and socialized into teaching online. It's not something that goes without saying. So I believe that without designing ongoing support for both students and teachers, to make the online effective and efficient, it will stay a huge gap between what we want from high order thinking, 21st century thinking, and most of the, these uh, expectations are not taking place at reality. Usually you, you, you use the technologies as in addition to different things, but not, not for replacing the things that are <coughs> already uh, there. I didn't move it here. Dig digital divide, we spoke, we spoke about it. Digital divide between uh, 
developed and developing countries between rich and poor, which is still huge. UNESCO, the World Bank are doing things, but sometimes quite stupid things. Uh, I once followed the project of the World Bank uh, establishing an uh, uh, online education in Kenya, African uh, Open University. But the whole idea was that they will put 50 something computers and people will stay in queue and hundreds of students will study with each computer. It's totally not feasible. So it was a, a white elephant, they spent a lot of money, it was totally not, not successful in uh, Africa. And the, the mobile technologies now provide more hope for bridging the digital divide. Uh, divide. Finding the golden triangle we spoke about of combining high quality large numbers of students and providing economies of scale, not found yet. Really not found yet. Because basically the online, uh, the premises of online teaching are based very much on the premises of face-to-face -face teaching. You have a professor with a small group. And so how do you provide economies of scale with such a small group? Only if you have larger group and then it's less efficient, or you have lower level academic faculty teaching this, this student, which is true in, in, in many places. So it, it, it's a huge problem. Finding the, uh, uh, moving from national to international landscape, we talked about it. Finding appropriate parties for collaboration in the academic and corporate world. I can say, I stayed here two years ago for two months, and I really admire what you are doing in collaborative Adventures. You are really doing the right thing. You are finding many collaborators with other universities, with industries, with international bodies. This is the way to go. Some universities do not know how to do it. Many the autonomous universities that want to be a single mode. Creating a closer interface with markets and knowledge society are also doing a very good job. Many universities do not uh, do it. Ensuring quality of teaching and evaluation and designing ongoing support for teachers and students, we talked about it. Now future prospects. The future prospects, and I want to say something about also the future university. Future prospects, in, obviously we have 100, more than 170 million students, but there are going to be more and more, more and more <coughs> demand for a higher education. The whole uh, problem is how you accommodate the diverse student clientele. Because one of the problems of universities like Tel Aviv universities, all research universities, is they teach 100% of the students as though they are going to be the future researchers, based on research. But more than 80 or 90% of the students that they teach are not going to be researchers. So how you accommodate the diverse and the divergent student clientele that have very different uh, kind of uh, needs in the same university. I believe that it's going to be through also more diverse higher education institutions. Not all higher education institutions should do the same, obviously. So the diversification of higher education is also growing, uh, going to grow. Perfect. The universities or program, the kind of offer we can develop at universities. Both. I think also different type of universities. You see, now I'm collecting material for a new book that is called Ideas of University, from Bologna University to now. The different ideas of university. And the cultures are so different, which is unbelievable. And I found something very interesting, that the British, the Brit Britain, they, they invent many types of universities. Every time when they had a wider demand for uh, students, they invent a new type of university. They had the Oxbridge, Oxford, and Cambridge Collegiate University. Many years, from the 12th century. In the 19th century, they invented the Federal London University. Very different type of university. When they had a huge demand again, they had the Red Brick Universities. And then the Glass Plated University, and the Open University. All the time, they invented new type of universities. In other places, like I think even Spain and uh, France, Usually you, you reproduce the same type of universities. So the, the cultures, <laughs> I don't say it is a critique, I say it is a fact, yes? But it, it's kind of, a, it's very different to look when, when you look at cultures. 
And so you asked about programs. So if, if the culture is that you reproduce the same time of university, so obviously the diversification is going to take place in programs. If we reproduce different type higher education institutions, it's going also to take place in higher education institutions. And you have so many different type higher education institutions, which is unbelievable. So when people speak about the notion of a university, it's so funny because there are so many different type universities. There is no, not anymore you can speak about what is the idea of a university, the kind of ideal type of university, the very different type of universities. Obviously, in the future, you have to find an already a perfect match for the trend of lifelong learning, part-time students throughout various stages of life, which you are doing also. A very nice job in this sense, and closer collaboration with the work and corporate world, which you also, this university is doing, some universities do not know how to do it, even my university is not very good in collaborating with the labor market and with the, though we sit in Roanana, which is a hub for high-tech technology, still we do not collaborate so much with, with, with these uh, universities. Growing cooperation with campus universities and collaborative teaching and research programs. I think it's already happening. You also mm -hmm. have it. Fabra University is the uh, campus-based university, or is it a uh, Fabra? Fab, 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 Fab. It's a campus. It's campus. Based. Okay, so, so it's exactly like, like like programs that you, you are doing. It's going to grow because the distance function and the campus functions are really merging. So, so yeah. the collaboration is going to grow and bridging over the digit, digital divide. There are many articles that speak on the fact that the uh, mobile technologies are going to be the technologies appropriate for the Far East and Africa and the developing world. They will jump over the online internet the fa uh, phase. Still not so much happening, but we will see. And being part of global universities. Here in uh, September, Ten months ago, I participated in a conference that you organized, your university organized, on ranking tables. And there, there are currently more than 50 ranking tables, and online universities are still outside the realm of ranking tables. So the whole idea of ranking tables, global universities, is, is something that is emerging, and online university will have, will have to be part of it. Utilizing, there is a growing, you have also a chair of distance education of distance education that is going to be mainly on open education resources, I believe. The focus and uh, the, the whole trend of open education resources is growing now. And I know that Fred Mulder, the former president of Dutch University, is now one of the chairs of UNESCO in open education resources, and somebody also from Athabasca University. And how you, you kind of define quality and assure quality in these open education resources is important, but it can uh, cut, cut, cut the expenses of developing high quality materials if we will succeed to use the open education resources widely. And obviously everybody is speaking about it, improving quality assurance mechanisms, which is tremendously important. Now the two last slides are some things that deal with future universities. Last November I was invited to give a lecture on future universities in Wroclaw, which is once was Breslau, and it the ones was a German university, German leading university. Uh, the Humboldt uh, University in Berlin was established in 1810, and the Breslau University was established in 1811. So it, exactly the same notion. And it was a huge ceremony there with the president of Germany and president of Poland and the president of Humboldt University in Berlin. And they talked very much about the future universities in relation to the whole idea of Humboldtian idea. In my talk, I said, by the way, that if the brothers, uh, Wilhelm and Alexander Humboldt, would have lived today, they would give a different type, they would chart a different type of university. Because the Humboldt University was very much appropriate for the national uh, shaping of na nations when, when they lived. Now we live in a very different time, and they would maybe shape a, a global university. And I would like to say several things what are going to be just the, the major characteristics of future universities and how universities that are distance universities like universities of Universidad Tuviera de Catalonia and my university can fit into this uh, over, overall uh, picture. 
unquestionably, there is going to be a growing private sector in the future. Daniel Levy is heading a research institute on private higher education in the United States. Uh, I think it's the only uh, research institute on private higher education. And he, I, I heard the lecture that he gave that it is the most fast developing sector in higher education. In some countries, 80 to 90 percent of higher education institutions are private. 80 to 90 percent. So we have to be ready for that. Of how we compete or collaborate or do with private higher education. So the private sector in any national system is going to grow significantly in the, the next decades. <coughs> The public sector will ask more and more from public universities to look for other national and international sources, which they already do. And here in Europe, for, the, for sure, with the Bologna process and the European Union and Commission of Europe and things like that, m many things are taking place. The, and funding comes beyond nation, na national funding. The thing that I said before, a growing differentiation of higher education institutions. A comprehensive universities, specific universities, institutes, academies. You know that in the United States, the um, Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching is classified in higher education institutions. Uh, I think five, six years ago, it stopped to use the term of classification of universities and colleges, and now it uses higher education institutions. And they have 34 different categories of higher education institutions in the United States. 34 different categories of higher education institutions in the United States, including three different categories for research universities, which are intensive research universities, extensive research universities, and mm -hmm. so on. So basically, the, the differentiation of higher education institutions is going to be very, very <coughs> high. Students, in their literature on global education and so on, they speak about up to 30% of international students, I don't know how many you have, in any given university. Before I came here, I participated, I, I belong to the, in the Israeli Council for Higher Education, to the Hero Group, here is the higher education reform experts for the Bologna. And we are trying now in Israel, we do not belong to the Bologna, but to kind of join the Bologna process and whatever is going on. And we had in Vilnius a t Tempus meeting <coughs> on the Bologna process, and. Uh, learning outcomes and all these things. In Bucharest, before in May, they had a meeting and they declared that by 2015, just three years from now, they expect all the 47 countries that belong to the Bologna process, that at least 20% of their student body will study at least three months, 15 ECTS in another country. Three years from now, 20% of the student body study at least three months outside the country, which is a very different kind of... Uh, online no, or just mobile? They speak not online. Online is something different, it's kind of online mobility. Okay. They speak on, on physical moving, of, of okay. learning another culture. <clears throat> this was exactly the idea of uh, the Erasmus program from the uh, so, Socrates mm -hmm. and all from the very start, to give a student the feeling that what is a culture in a different place. And by the way, I know the people that made the evaluation, Ulrich Teichmann or somebody else, uh, Stamenka, uh, they made the first evaluation of the Erasmus students. And at the beginning, the whole idea was acculturation and culturation, kind of giving the feeling of uh, different cultures. And the evaluations of students turned the whole idea that it started the Bologna process. Because students that went to the United Kingdom wrote a very good evaluations about wonderful relations between professors and students. Small classes, professors very attentive to students, very much the tutorial uh, tradition of Britain. British students that went to Germany, to Italy and France, wrote terrible evaluations about professors, huge number of students in any classroom, not attentive at all to students, terrible. And the whole idea was that suddenly you felt that the traditions and cultures in different countries are so different that you have to do something about it. This is when in 19, 1998, when the four ministers of Britain, Germany, Italy, and France met in Sorbonne to celebrate 
the 800 years to the uh, French uh, university, they decided it was the Sorbonne Declaration and a year after came Bologna Declaration. So the whole idea was that suddenly the feeling was that there are so different cultures, so, so many different structures of uh, degrees and diplomas that in order to collaborate, you need at least to understand what is taking place. Like, many people do not know, for example, that in Oxford and Cambridge, they are an exception, up, to, up till now, they do not have a modular system. You study for three years, and you do not get any grades for the courses, for things that you do. Only at the end of three years, you take one large exam that can take five to 10 days, and based on this, you get a degree which is the honors degree, it can be the first level, the second upper, and so on. A very different system. And in, when they have the modular system, it just six big courses. I remember my president says, I got a, a, a kind of diploma from England. What, what kind of a degree it is with six courses? I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> so, so, so basically, if, if you do not know the structures, it, it, it's really very much yeah. misleading. So the whole idea was to make a harmonization of uh, the degree. Uh, faculty, up to 30% uh, percent international scholars, which was also interesting. In Vilnius, when we were, we spoke about different cultures. And people that came from Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, said that their students are very much eager to go outside and to have an experience outside. But the professors are very much afraid because they do not they do not feel comfortable to speak in English and to lecture in English. And they, in Israel, it's the other way around. Because the professors, the, the whole idea of going out is very much based on sabbaticals that we have, and special funds that we have to go out. Students do not go out because of barriers of language and so on. So you see how the culture are, are also very different for students and uh, for uh, professors. Lifelong learning, obviously, a growing number of lifelong learners in any university in the future. And the last, uh, Transparency research. Conducted research more and more, you know, is conducted within international consortia and frameworks. You are very much involved in it, so no reason to, to elaborate more on it. Language of instruction. Here is a very delicate problem for Spanish speaking people. According to various statistics, I think, I think even that Spanish native speakers outnumber English native speakers. Native speakers. Not, not speakers. So you have a huge, huge population of Spanish speakers in Latin America and also in Europe. But most of the publications, the mainstream publications, are conducted in English. So it's a huge, huge dilemma of the language of instruction that is becoming more and more, the lingua franca is becoming English, exactly like I speak here. I remember several years ago there was a big colloquium in Paris in the Forum of Higher Education Research and Knowledge, which I was part of. And George Haddad is the head of the Division of Higher Education there. And I, I made a summary of something and I said, I dare to say here in Paris, standing in UNESCO, that English has become the lingua franca of the academic world. And George Haddad was very angry. Because he said French is still an international language, a very important one. And you should acknowledge it. It was once a diplomatic language. So the issue of languages is a huge one, also in Israel. In Israel, when Israel was established, there was a huge debate which was going to be the, the language of instruction in its first, before Israel was established. Because the Technion was established in 1924, and Hebrew University in 1925, and Israel was established in 1948. And most of the professors came from Germany. So they wanted to teach in German. <laughs> and there, there was called as the War of Languages. It was really entitled the War of Languages. And it was decided that by no way they had to teach in Hebrew. Because it was the whole revival of the Hebrew language and the whole idea. Mm -hmm. But now, if you want international students, if you want students from India and from China, and from all, you need to teach in English. So Weizmann Institute, for example, which is a very uh, high-level uh, graduate uh, research-oriented institute, teaches all of its courses in English, all of its courses. And it has students from 35 different countries. Mm -hmm. But most other universities teach in Hebrew. So only designated program, programs in English are. So the, the, the problem of languages is really a, a, a huge problem. 
a growing market, marketization of programs, obviously you know about it, and uh, there are going to be in the future established more uh, benchmarks for international quality assurance mechanisms, which is a huge issue. Everybody talks about it, but still it's not something that was stabilized. And gradual change of academic environment, which this university is part of it, because you teach totally online and very successfully. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.